All right, welcome back everybody to What the Health. I'm Dr. Greg Eckel and I've got my esteemed colleague and guest, Evan Brand, who has been on What the Health before. Uh, Evan is a podcast host. He is a certified functional medicine practitioner, nutritional therapist. He is passionate about healing chronic fatigue and obesity and depression epidemics. Um, he put it all together for himself. And I think what inspired him was helped him. Uh, he found out how to help himself uh, cure his IBS and depression issues. Um, he uses at home lab testing, customized supplement programs to find and fix the root cause of a wide range of health symptoms. Evan, welcome aboard. Dr. Greg, thanks for having me. Thanks. You know, what I wanted to bring you on and talk about really, um, our, you know, our topic today, we want to talk about brain, brain health, neurodegeneration, and the often overlooked aspects of this care. You know, all too often, I'm talking to people around the globe uh, dealing with Parkinson's disease and other neurodegeneration, and I've just found they are not getting adequate workups. Uh, you know, with their conventional, right, in neurodegeneration and brain health, they're just kind of wallowing of, they get diagnosed and they get parked. Um, and I'm wondering and curious, you know, you're dealing with thousands of folks around the globe as well, uh, what you're seeing in your practice in nutritional therapy and um, kind of some insights and some clues that you can help folks with here. Yeah, well, I'm not dealing with the same population as you. At least these people haven't been diagnosed officially with Parkinson's. Many of them may have symptoms and they kind of joke, oh my God, I think I have Parkinson's because I'm not functioning at all and I'm going into rooms that I shouldn't be going into and I'm running into things and I've got this new trimmer and I've got all these weird movement things and I'm not dragging my feet, but my legs feel kind of weird and heavy. Do I have something going on? I said, well, you know, consult your, your MDs for that. But at least what I can do is look into your body systems and try to figure out what the heck's going on. And so I really like to use organic acids testing. It's one of my favorites. Um, organic acids testing, there's a couple companies out there that do it. I like Great Plains because they, they treat me really well regarding their sample reporting and their accuracy is great. They've got all sorts of markers on here that you can use to correlate things to Parkinson's and neurodegenerative issues. You can measure all the neurotransmitters on there. So you can look at your homovanalic, which is an organic acid. This is something you pee out. So this is a metabolite, you pee it out, and then that correlates to dopamine levels. And we know with some of these neurodegenerative problems, there are issues with neurotransmitters and you can measure it. It's awesome. And you don't even have to go anywhere. You can just wake up, pee in the cup, and then boom, uh, we measure, uh, 5-hydroxy indolacetic acid, that's a marker for serotonin, so we can look at that. And then we correlate those numbers with what we see on stool testing, which to me, a lot of people miss the connection, but the gut and the brain are intimately linked. We know that even some papers this year have come out on probiotics being helpful for depression. And people may say, well, probiotics, I thought that's for your gut. How would that help with your mood? Well, it does. Number one, it acts as an anti-inflammatory. You know, people are against antibiotics, but they do have, I'm talking drugs now, antibiotics, they do have anti-inflammatory uh, properties. This is why if you take a kid who's having some type of a psychiatric issue, such as pandas, that I would argue pandas is one manifestation of a brain issue. It's this auto, it's pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disease associated with strep. That's panda. So basically a strep gut infection, which we can test for on urine and stool can create, for lack of a better word, a pissed off immune system. That immune system can then start to attack the brain. And then you get all these neuropsychiatric problems. Now, not Parkinson's we're talking, we're talking kids now, but the treatment in the conventional world is antibiotics. The antibiotics knock down the strep bacteria. And then all of a sudden, all these quote brain issues go away. Now I prefer it not to get to that crisis level. And that's where we'll use probiotics to try to see if we can crowd out some of the bad bacteria. And then, you know, we'll bring in some antimicrobial herbs to kill stuff. But the truth is that if you're ignoring the gut, if you've come this far, you're listening, you have some type of an issue, whether it's memory, whether it's focus, concentration, sleep issues, energy problems, maybe it's uh, some type of a multiple personality disorder. I'm convinced that a lot of that's due to neurotransmitter issues. 
conventional medical doctors are going to put you on antipsychotic drugs. They're going to put you on antidepressants. They may put you on sleeping medication for the sleep issues. They may put you on uh, anti-anxiety for the anxiety issues, but they're missing the boat. They're not looking into your gut. I mean, when has your psychiatrist ever looked at your neurotransmitters and said, hey, you know, you've got low serotonin. This may be because you're not digesting well and we need to give you some digestive enzymes. That conversation has probably never happened in a psychiatrist's office. And if your psychiatrist has told you that, please have them contact my office. I'd love to interview them, but I doubt, I doubt that's happened. So when I work with people, like I said, they're not like uh, your patients where they're saying, hey, I've got to clear uh, Parkinson's diagnosis, but these are people that all, I would say 90 plus percent are reporting, hey, I've got some brain stuff. I'm forgetting my keys. I forgot my best friend's name. I'm walking into a room. I don't know why I'm in there. I bumped into the wall. Uh, and then I'm also dragging through the day. I'm using caffeine, that kind of stuff. What can you do for me? We look at the stool and the urine and it opens up a huge amount of information for us to proceed and help modify some of those markers by using nutritional medicine, herbs, supplements, whatever we have to do. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, it, it is, uh, you know, that component around the psychiatric component, orthomolecular medicine has been awesome. Um, that some of my predecessors and best learnings around that, that aspect has been, you know, on nutritional therapy and how that um, helps heal the mind. And, and that gut brain connection of what you're talking and speaking into is such um, such a huge aspect, right? Um, I just did a master class on that, um, the gut brain connection, and we do form these uh, neurotransmitters, you know, the gut as the second brain, as we've kind of been taught and now know. Um, wondering on kind of uh, hidden gems for folks around, let's just, we'll keep it not in the neurodegenerative component, but just around brain health with, you know, you're dealing with a lot of fatigue, uh, brain fog, memory issues, right? A lot of folks are aging and their providers or their, you know, the community is just saying, oh, get used to it. You're getting old, uh, which we hear on what the health call hogwash on. Um, so what, uh, you know, what are, what other facets, you know, we, we were talking about, um, you know, kind of some connections around molds and mycotoxins and um, sometimes dental infections. These are secrets that you have really seen those patterns in your, uh, in your practice. I'm wondering if you could share some stories around some folks that you've helped around those. Sure. I mean, I think brain issues in general have a root in some sort of toxicity. Now, is this internal toxicity due to mycotoxins that you're recirculating because it used to live, work, breathe in a water damaged building? Are these things like heavy metals where you're getting exposed to from the conventional mercury fillings? You know, those silver fillings are 50 plus percent mercury. We know there's a huge massive neurotoxic effect of mercury on brain cells. And so when we look at these people, you know, I've had clients who they've had tremors and other issues, and they've gotten their mercury fillings removed and replaced with a more compatible, safe material. And guess what? Some of these, quote, Parkinson's-like symptoms, they just disappear. And so whether it's heavy metals, whether it's glyphosate, 2,4-D, other herbicides, pesticides, heavy metals, mycotoxins, which mycotoxins are something you breathe in. And so you can eat them in the food as well. Dave Asprey, the Bulletproof Coffee guy, he did a great uh, documentary called Moldy that was all about mold. And it is true that you can get exposed to mold and mold toxins, what are called mycotoxins. You can get exposed to these from food, but it's a small amount. So we're talking moldy coffee, moldy nuts. Uh, we're talking moldy grains, potentially. You know, there's such thing as farmer's lung. So farmers that work around moldy hay, if they're like, throwing out the hay for the cattle, for example, and it's moldy, you, they could breathe in mycotoxins and it can really damage the lungs. It's really, really potent and toxic to the immune system too. So when we see people with candida overgrowth, that's another big thing we're looking at from the functional side. And candida is an opportunistic yeast that in, I would say in the majority of cases, it's benign, meaning it's not at an overgrowth level, but that's not true anymore. I mean, the average person is so toxic and so sick, I would say that there's not really many healthy controls to even look at anymore, which is kind of sad. But normally, let's just say back in the day, maybe, candida would not be that big of a deal. The body would keep it in relative balance. But now with all the pesticide herbicides that are killing off like glyphosate, People think, oh, I just need to buy organic because it's good for me. No, you need to buy organic because if you're eating 
like a conventional strawberry. There's been studies done by the environmental working group on this. You've get, you're getting an average of 22 different pesticides on a conventionally, what should be called chemically grown strawberry. Right. And even parts per billion PPB of glyphosate has been shown to kill off the beneficial bacteria in the gut. And then guess what happens? You get candida overgrowth because there's no good guys to crowd out candida. And then you may get clostridia. Now for the brain conversation, this is a huge, huge piece of the puzzle. And then I'll go back to the mold thing in a second. Specifically on the organic acids test, there's a marker we look at called HPHPA. This is very important for someone that's dealing with kids with autism or adults just with cognitive problems. And what happens is, let's just use that glyphosate situation. You've been eating a diet with non-organic food. You've killed all the good bacteria off in your gut. Now you have a candida overgrowth. Now you have clostridia overgrowth. Certain species of these clostridia bacteria increase this organic acid, HPHPA. What that does is it inhibits an enzyme called dopamine beta hydroxylase. This is an enzyme that normally works fine. And what it does is it's gonna allow the breakdown of your neurotransmitters like dopamine into norepinephrine and epinephrine. And this breakdown is, is normal and it's a good thing and it's supposed to happen. However, when you eat bad foods that have chemicals, remember all the overgrowth happens now the HPHPA goes up. Now this enzyme doesn't work the way it's supposed to. And you get a buildup of neurotransmitters in the brain. You can get aggression. You can get rage. These are the kids who bite people. These are the people who may get homicidal or suicidal or may road rage. I mean, it literally just makes you crazy. And I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clients with elevated HPHPA due to that clostridia overgrowth in their gut. And I'll ask them, hey, just be upfront, be honest with me. Are you crazy? And they all laugh and they go, oh yeah, well, if you ask my husband, you ask my wife, yeah, they say I'm crazy. And I'm like, no, but seriously, like, are you having crazy thoughts? Are you, are you having OCD behavior? Are you road raging? Are you flying off the handle at, you know, at the drop of the hat? Are you emotionally sensitive? You're crying easily. You, you're just not stable emotionally. And all of them say, no, I'm really not. You know, I really need help in that department. And all, now, now let me just compare and contrast again to a conventional medicine those people are going to get diagnosis, maybe schizophrenic, or they're going to have mania, or the rapid cycling bipolar disorder, or some kind of name, right? And then what that does is that allows them to legally create a drug to treat those symptoms. And guess what? They never brought up clostridia. They never brought up diet. They never brought up the organic piece. And they don't get better. They don't get the answer. So what we'll do is we'll come in. We'll use herbs to kill off the clostridia. Conventional treatment would be antibiotics. We'll knock out the clostridia, that enzyme starts to work perfectly again, and then the neurotransmitters balance back out. So that's like one big clinical pearl that I've seen, you know, that's huge. So if you want to comment on it, please do. And then let's talk about mold a little more. Yeah, for sure. The, you know, that aspect of the organic acid testing and uncovering the kind of the block in the pathway for these folks is such a huge thing where you actually correct the underlying root imbalance where then they're corrected. They're not needing medications for the rest of their lives or having a label of the diagnosis, which is really pathological in and of itself. Um, you know, because once you get put on certain antipsychotics, you never come off of those. So um, it is really a great service that you're, you've caught on to that and that you're, you know, that we're talking about it here with the What the Health folks, uh, because it is, you know, that's why I created this show. Uh, folks, you know, this is What the Health, uh, Dr. Greg Eckel, Evan Brand, my guest, and we are talking about brain health here. If you like what you're hearing, please share us with your loved ones. This is how we get the word out. This is not coming from mainstream media. Uh, we are needing to do kind of a groundswell from, from the people up. Uh, this is how we help our families. So, you know, this is a big one. If you have anybody in your family that is having, you know, uncontrolled rage or short fuse, irritability, um, just kind of flies off the rails, well, this is some testing that could be very valuable for them and for their loved ones and their families. And so, you know, that's how we do create more stability in our lives is helping people heal. Um, so this is a big, that's a big piece. And that is a great clinical pearl, Evan. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, yeah, now my pleasure. So 
Yeah. So, so the liver's involved too. I mean, a lot of toxicity, anger. I mean, if you kind of subscribe to any of the Chinese medicine philosophies, I think they were right on a lot of stuff. They'll talk about anger and irritability and these kind of mood things we're talking about is related to the liver. So we'll ask people things like, well, do you have dark circles under your eyes or do you have any discomfort on the low right quadrant under your rib cage there? That's the liver gallbladder area. Those type of questions can be helpful. I'll tell you truthfully, I often use liver support though. I mean, mm. pretty much any protocol that I'm going to use, I'm going to use liver support too, because if we're killing off all these bacteria, we're killing off candida, you know, parasites are part of the puzzle too. I'll tell you when I had parasite infections, I had Giardia and I had Cryptosporidium. These are two common waterborne parasites. I grew up swimming in lakes and creeks and playing in rivers and doing fun kid stuff. And and I got parasites and I lost a bunch of weight without trying and I just felt malnourished and my fingernails had ridges on them, which indicated some sort of malabsorption. And I tested my stool and sure enough, there the infections were. And I believe that was a huge part of my depression were these gut infections. Now, is it the mechanism that the gut infections were creating brain inflammation? Is it the mechanism of the parasites were stealing my nutrients and therefore I didn't have enough raw nutrition to fuel my brain chemistry? I think it's all of it. And so, I've noticed a huge personal and clinical correlation between improving the gut and then improving the mood. So don't skip out on those tests. And then let's talk about the mold piece a little more because this is kind of a new discovery for me, unfortunately. Uh, I built a brand new house a few years ago and uh, my wife and I just started to get some weird symptoms, heart palpitations and brain fog. And my wife would say that I looked pale and my blood pressure was starting to get unstable and my sleep was not very good. And I just attributed it to stress. I mean, I was doing a ton of interviews. I was, you know, full-time working clinically. I mean, you know how it is when you're dealing with sick people as a clinician yourself, it, it gets kind of draining. And, uh, and we have to really, for us to serve people, we've got to really be feeling good. And so we've got to protect ourselves. And I thought, well, um, maybe I just burned out, you know, I've had a lot of really tough clients and it wasn't that. And so luckily uh, a friend of mine who I'm forever grateful to a friend of mine, Dr. Jack Wolfson, he's a cardiologist. Uh, I just texted him one morning and I thought, Jack, I'm waking up dizzy and my blood pressure is not stable. And he replies in all capital letters to my text, mold. Hmm. I thought, no freaking way. Yeah. There's no way. And anyway, it turns out his wife got exposed and she had a lot of the same issues. So that's how he knew to clue me into it. And so sure enough, I ran the urine testing to confirm this on my body and confirmed I had a ton of mold. And this was probably from many, many places, you know, people try to figure out where this come from. I remember as a kid spending time in my grandmother's basement, it would flood and she would just turn on the box fan and it would take two weeks to dry out that carpet in the basement. And we know that after 48 hours of something being wet, you've got mold growth. And so I'm sure it was a massive, massive load of mycotoxins as a kid. And then I probably just had exposures over the years that eventually just kind of broke the camel's back. And the, the, the problem with the mold thing is, number one, there's very few medical doctors who know anything about this. Dr. Shoemaker is kind of the godfather of mold and mycotoxins. He talks all about cholestyramine and well call and some of these prescription binders to help people and various peptides and hormone supports. But outside of him and a few others, there's not many medical docs that know much about this. So if you go to your doctor and say, hey, I think I'm depressed or anxious or I have blood pressure problems because of mold, they're going to think you're crazy, which is really sad. But either way, you can test for it via urine. You can confirm whether or not you have this problem. And the problem is, the problem with the problem is men don't typically show as many symptoms as women. So if you're in a moldy house, for example, the man may feel fine and the woman does not feel fine. So the man tells the woman she's crazy and she needs mental help. But the truth is her genetics may be different. She may have a genetic defect where her body does not recognize or process the mold in the mycotoxins and therefore she gets a buildup. Whereas the man, he, it's possible that his body and his immune system recognizes it, creates sort of a detoxification process for it, and then floods it out of the system. Now me, I guess I was not genetically lucky with that. And I got a buildup of mold toxin. And so using strategic binders like cholestyramine and charcoal and zeolite and, and other types of clays, chlorella, you can pull out these things. And the cool thing is re regarding your patients, a lot of these binders we're talking about, they're not just for mold. Like chlorella can help with heavy metals. So if you've got somebody that's got a neurodegenerative problem, 
you know, you're probably already using chlorella with these people and you can sell them on the idea of, hey, look, we're pulling out this mold, but guess what? We're also pulling out heavy metals, pesticide, herbicide, petroleum chemicals. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've tested that have gasoline off the charts in their bodies from driving on the highway every day to go to work and they're breathing in car exhaust. Even if the recirc vents on, you're still getting exposed to car exhaust, for example. Uh, you're out west where you got freaking wildfire smoke everywhere right now. And those, even the wildfire smoke is full of all sorts of um, like Alzheimer's uh, causing chemicals. I'm sure you've read about this, but the building materials and all the, it's not just like trees and grasses burning. I mean, it's right. cities. That are, right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Plastic. I mean, it's crazy. So uh, we're under assault in regards to toxicity. So, you know, I think for long-term longevity, safety, if you, you know, I have, I have clients that'll ask me, you know, we'll, we'll get into a protocol and they'll say, well, how long do I have to take supplements? Hmm. And I'm like, this is such a huge open-ended question, but I'll usually shoot back at them and I'll say, well, uh, Jane, do you want to survive or do you want to thrive? Well, duh, I want to thrive, Evan. I'm like, well, then you got to take supplements forever because we're exposed to things now that our ancestors couldn't even have dreamed of. I mean, you put on polyester yoga pants. What's that polyester? That's plastic. You're wearing plastic. Yeah. Uh, did you see the, uh, there was a paper, I, I don't remember what journal it was, but it came out this year and it was titled, The New Acid Rain is Plastic Rain. Mm. And apparently these researchers set out all these little cups in the middle of the Rocky Mountains, like pristine areas where humans never go. And every single sample they had a dry cup that would collect just dry air and then they had a wet cup that would collect rainwater and like 99 percent of the samples collected there's plastic micro particles of plastic so it's literally raining plastic in the most pristine areas of the planet and we know those affect the brain and those affect your hormones which control and regulate the brain's function so there are no safe pristine places to hide anymore and that sounds really depressing but you just have to face it and you have to put in a protocol to yeah. work on this. So one on, on the mold mycotoxin component, Dr. Jill Krista, a colleague of mine, also I went to naturopathic school, has a great resource, Break the Mold book out there for folks that are listening. Um, I've had her on What the Health as well. Also had her and uh, Evan on the Brain Degeneration Summit. Um, which we are going to release again next year. Um, so that mold mycotoxin, th that is an often overlooked, right? We got Richie Schumacher, kind of the, the godfather of really educating the medical community and the North America around that um, sick building syndrome. Mold, mold is a big deal. Um, it is, you know, I also, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, which is the flood capital of the United States. Um, we had a, a massive flood every hundred years basically for three centuries then they they wised up and dammed they they closed the dams that were up in the hills above the city so brilliant only took 300 years thank you ancestors uh but it is you know growing up in mold um you know same thing in the northwest tremendous amount of mold like we live in a very damp environment here so it is, you know, I'll see patients that have had to move out, like they're like out in the desert, right? High desert, like they just, they're extremely sick because of the mold has attacked their uh, basically immune system, nervous system connection, and they become sensitized to everything. Let me um, ask you this. Yeah. I'm, I'm always curious. So, so those patients you're talking about that moved to the high desert, do you see that that's a big game changer for them or, or, or not so much? It, 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 holds the, it holds them steady. It hasn't done anything to unwind their nervous system, immune system complexes that happened as a result of the mycotoxin kind of uh, boil, I call it. You know, you're just kind of in that slow boil until it's like you can't get out of it anymore. So it does, you know, removal is the first step in environmental medicine is get out of the cause. So it's move out of your house. So it does help get them out of the environment. And there is less mold in that environment. But unfortunately, it's not the be all end all because, you know, the, the system, the, the system is still wired now for this attack. And and the insult that was the mold. So the mycotoxin and the immunocomplexes that occur from that are still raging. 
So you have to unwind it. The, the binders that you talk about, activated charcoal, I have chlorella in my brain health smoothie. So that is a piece of the puzzle on the metal front, but also, you know, hedging the bet on the molds because of the, that immuno system uh, kind of immune interface with our brain health. Um, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of people, they get this idea that like if they just move to like a desert island, that everything's going to be fine. But the problem is the body's really lazy. You could call it smart, but also lazy in the sense that it really doesn't want to make new bile. And a lot of these mycotoxins get recirculated through the bile. There's a process in the body called enterohepatic, meaning, you know, enterohepatic system, biliary system, and enterohepatic recirculation, big fancy word, basically only 5% of bile is, is new and 95% is recycled. So imagine that you go to this desert island and you've got this water hose full of toxins, but the water hose is connected to itself. So no matter where you go, you're bringing this toxicity with you and it's not magically going to get out unless you'd use the binders and you stop or redirect using things to help support that phase two detox pathway, whether it's amino acids or whether it's extra bile salts or artichoke or beet powder, or maybe supplemental bowel to, to kind of further the, the bowel flow plus the binders. If you don't do that, you can move and you won't get much better. And I've debated that. I thought, man, I'm just going to go out to the desert for six months and see what happens. But I haven't because I've had clients do that. And they bring it with them. And then also not to mention too, there's this phenomenon called colonization. And luckily we can test for this and prove this on paper on the organic acids, which is just incredible. Um, on page one specifically, there is a, uh, a, whole, a whole bunch of markers and uh, there, I would share my screen if I could, but if you just look on a sample report of Great Plains organic acid, you can see it. There's a big long word on here. Uh, number two, it's called 5-hydroxymethyl-2-feroic acid. And then in parentheses, it says aspergillus. And there's several of these. There's ferran 2 5 carbolic There's ferran carbonoglycine. There's tartaric. And these different organic acids that show up in the urine correlate to the growth of aspergillus in the system. Meaning, yeah, that's what I said. You literally can be growing aspergillus. And so if you have which it's not 100% clear, but the theory is if you get exposed to enough mold or long enough mold exposure or the immune system is weak enough, then the colonization can take place. Now, if you just go stay at like a moldy hotel for a few days, you're probably okay, not good for you, but probably okay. But if you lived in a moldy house or worked in a moldy office for five years, yeah. probably enough to create colonization. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means you're colonized, meaning in your gut and in your sinus cavity, you probably have aspergillus growing and guess what that's doing? You're now a mycotoxin factory. You're not just a mycotoxin reservoir. You're a factory. So you're now producing them internally. So you go to the desert island. Well, you're still making mycotoxins. And so then we have to come in. Now, conventional docs are going to use antifungal drugs. Uh, I'm not a medical doc. I don't prescribe. So I don't use those drugs. I'm kind of biased against them. There are some medical docs out there that will argue, well, herbs are not powerful enough. You have to use drugs. Look at the CDC right now, though. They're freaking out about candida and all these resistant strains of candida. They're calling it antifungal resistance. Everyone's heard about antibiotic-resistant bacteria killing people like MRSA and C. diff. You go to the doctor. They'll pump you full of antibiotics. They don't work. The infection kills you. That's now happening with species of fungus. And so for me, the antifungal drugs are just off the table. Maybe if I were extremely miserable, I would be open to trying it. But for me, I'm going to come in with using antifungal herbs, whether it's Paul de Arco, which is a bark, or French tarragon, or olive leaf. I'm going to use things to kind of knock these fungal colonies down. We may do some silver hydrosol in the nose or in the gut to try to kill and break down bile films. But until you get that stuff fixed, your brain's not going to work properly. So people are like, man, you guys are like in a rabbit hole over here. No, it's all connected to the brain because when I first started spraying xylitol, which is a natural sweetener that can be used as a nasal rinse, a beautiful company out of Utah called x uh, For all those wildfire people, you all should probably be spraying that stuff up your nose daily. Um, <laughs> x is a xylitol rinse. They have one called Rescue that has essential oils in it, which is incredibly potent. You spray this stuff up your nose and what it can do is it can help kill and break down some of these biofilm and fungal colonies in the, in the sinuses. When I first started doing that, I was so dizzy, I couldn't even look at a computer screen. I remember I was about to jump on a call and review some lab results and I started blinking. I'm like, I cannot even see straight. What is going on? 
And turns out there's a huge connection between your vision and your sinus cavity and mold, mold growth. So when you start killing the mold off, it's so close to your brain. I guess the assumption is the mycotoxins get direct access through the blood brain barrier and then boom, your vision doesn't work. Dr. Shoemaker talks about this test called a VCS test. So someone listening, maybe they're like, okay, how do I investigate this right away? Look up V as in Victor, C as in Charlie, S as in Sam, VCS test. It's called a visual contrast sensitivity test. It's free, it's online. And you're basically gonna be looking at little circles of gray color. And there's arrows inside of these colors. And you need to determine what direction are the arrows pointing. Something like that's how it works. I failed it, which means I've been exposed to biotoxins. That could include Lyme as well. Lyme is also a biotoxin, just like mycotoxins. And your vision doesn't work properly when you have those biotoxins. It affects the blood flow to the optic nerve, is I believe the mechanism. As you detox, that's how you can gauge your progress. Number one, you're going to feel better. Your brain's going to work better. But number two, your vision gets more clear. So when I take charcoal, within 30 minutes, my vision is like choop, super clear. It clears up. And so that's the binding of the toxicity. And then you're removing it out through the stool, assuming that you're pooping. Constipation is another big issue with brain function. So many people report brain fog. I ask them, how often are you pooping? Oh, once every few days. No way. Yeah. You need to be pooping at least twice a day. Now, back in the day when I was pooping a lot more than that, that was IBS. You don't want to be pooping too much either because then you're not absorbing your nutrition. So, you know, I would say the sweet spot is probably two good poops a day, banana shape, banana size, banana consistency. And you shouldn't have to wipe your butt a lot to get it clean. I call it the ghost poop. You want to wipe your butt and nothing's there. That's the ghost poop. That's good. That means that you probably have a decent balance of gut bacteria. If you get into the category where you have bacterial overgrowth, the gas, the bloating, the brain fog, the messy poops, the floating stools, the non-well-formed stools, that's all part of it. And this all connects directly back to the brain. So if you let me keep ranting, I'm going to rant all day. So I'm going to pause now. <laughs> I was just going to see where you're going with that. You know, it is um, that aspect If we kind of set this up in the brain health front. Um, one concept around the mycotoxins and candida and these kind of co-infections are, uh, you know, some of the viruses, some of the candida can be seen as a protective mechanism. I think what I, I I've come to this new, um, new style of practice in a oneness uh, aspect, meaning um, if we look at kind of the universe as a, as a whole and as a one, and we're in that universe, right? There's an old saying in Chinese medicine as you are in the universe, the universe is in you. Um, and there's some old adages as, around that, around, you know, kind of one planet, kind of a Gaia hypothesis. Now, I'm going to go out there for a second, Evan, but follow along. I'm here. I'm listening at home. Um, but as you balance the terrain, as you balance your terrain out, there's less reason for being susceptible to mold, being susceptible to candida. So I don't really go after, I don't use any more war analogies around dealing with the body or health. Um, and it's really around, can we make your, the host, you, less hospitable to other? So you're right, when we talk on this whole conversation here for the last 40 minutes, around we are getting insulted by plastics and metals and mycotoxins and candida like and parasites like these things are in the environment and they do set up shop some of these things we've never been exposed to before in human history um, which is uh, the issue i think around you know really cleaning up the environment looking at processes of uh, manufacturing etc that said what can we do about it today so i don't really go after um, the candida. I find the candida is really there oftentimes around metal toxicity. So when people have metals, it's actually there as a protective mechanism um, and it's trying to sequester the mercury so it doesn't get into the brain or into the cells. So really looking at it, you know, because you know, when I first started practice in the, in the early 90s, mid 90s, I was seeing all of these women that had been on the anti-candida for 15 years from the 80s, right? The 80s was the decade of the anti-candida diet, 1980s, right? Um, so I started uh, medical school in 96. And these women would just look at candida or at, at a piece of toast 
and or a simple carbohydrate and they get a yeast infection. They're like, what in the world? I've been on this really strict anti-candida diet. Why? We started testing all of those women for, um, for metals and found, lo and behold, they had a heavy metal toxicity. And so once we got the metals out of them, the candida went away. So yes, you got to deal with the symptoms if it's causing uh, causing significant uh, upset in the individual, but I've just found going to that deeper level of understanding, like maybe, you know, I also see that with viruses, Epstein-Barr, Cytolomegalo, herpes simplex, that they are showing um, that these are protective mechanisms against certain metals, um, other misfolded proteins, et cetera. Kind of fast forward into one discussion on brain health, looking at Alzheimer's and the beta amyloid plaques that are formed. Well, what we're understanding now, I was just doing some research over the weekend around this, and it's on PubMed, um, around these viruses uh, actually are trying to clear the debris out of our brains. And to, to do that, they'll create these misfolded proteins or these beta amyloid plaques, which Currently, when you just look at the pathology of Alzheimer's, it's tr how do we get rid of these plaques? These plaques are the issues. Like, no, the plaques are actually there in the inherent intelligence of our bodies. It's trying to clear them out. So it's trying to wall them off. So if we have to always go up a couple levels upstream is what I'm finding. And, and it's, way, it's more fun to get out of the war analogy around helping the body heal. Um, yeah, I was in the I was in kind of the whack a mole analogy. I didn't go like the war level because it always seemed kind of harsh on the body. But I I would joke around and say, well, it's kind of whack a mole because what yeah. would happen is, like we would knock out parasites and then H pylori shows up, and then we knock that down and then something else shows up. And I'm like, man, this isn't really good. Yeah, so I like the the terrain idea. It is getting much 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 more popular now. Let me ask you this: so uh, if you see like a crazy like if you ran an oat test and you see like a a crazy candida overgrowth. Are you going to come in and use antifungals at all? Or are you just going to do the chlorella, like heavy metal detox? Well, I will give some support with olive leaf and the herbals, but that, that's okay. kind of where I was commenting on. You You didn't say the war analogy, but I wanted to put that out there because I think a lot of our listeners, um, we've got a lot of providers that watch the, and listen to the show as well. Um, I really want to be um, kind of May, you know, putting this concept out of the terrain. Um, it is so important. We're seeing it more and more in medicine. And um, so, yes, you, you know, you, there's, a, there's a balance in there, right? It doesn't mean ignore the candida, um, but it's, I, I see a lot of providers kind of just treating the lab tests of saying, okay, well, let's retest and now the candida is gone. But like you're saying, you notice like, oh, there is the whack-a-mole game is like, okay, that's gone, but now this is happening. It's like, because the innate intelligence is saying, well, wait a minute, I'm not in balance yet. And so I've got to, I got to keep throwing these symptoms up to say, pay attention to me, I'm out of balance here. Yeah. Uh, so what you're saying is you may come in, you'll still use antifungals, correct? Correct. Okay. But if you come in and you address the root of the root, I mean, we're going a whole nother layer of root cause now, not candida is the root cause of the brain fog. Okay, root cause of that's heavy metals. Right. So you're saying when you go the extra layer, maybe you're using some like a GI detox, which is what I have on here on my desk. This yeah. podcast is not sponsored by them. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's got zeolite, it's got charcoal, it's got fulvic acid, it's got silica. It's effective for heavy metals and some of the stuff in the gut. So you're saying that if you're going to use antifungals, maybe you're using detox support in the back end. And then therefore you're saying candida will we won't want to say gone because that's not the goal, but let's say it's back to balance and it will back stay in balance. Is that what you're saying? That's right. And I, that's what I've been seeing as well. That d it does actually work that way. And you think heavy metals are the big smoking gun for the yeast piece? I do. Yeah. Mercury yeah. in particular for candida. Um, I learned that from one of my mentors about 20 years ago and it has played out ever since. So um, well, it, it makes sense. I mean, you're not seeing a ton of people. I mean, you, you, you will see cadmium and aluminum and all that, but I mean, uh, I think you'd probably say mercury is the most widespread because of all the fillings and the, yeah. I mean, the fish are contaminated, right? And yep. tons of other sources. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are the four main big ones. It's cadmium, arsenic, mercury, and lead. Those are the biggies, but in particular for the candida discussion. I don't want to just get stuck there though. So let's keep it moving uh, sure. for you. Um, around, so we talked on the mycotoxins, the uh mold, candida, uh, other kind of smoking guns as, as far as like the symptoms around brain fog, fatigue, memory issues, 
Um, I know I've seen you speak to dental infections along those lines. Are, is that a leading question that you have for folks that are engaged with you in your process, Evan? Yeah, good question. So it's on the intake form for every new person that comes in. We'll ask them, have you had your wisdom teeth removed? You know, are there root canals? How many silver fillings do you have? Those kind of questions. And that'll clue us in. I mean, of course, you and I, we're not seeing people that feel amazing. Right. That's why they're coming to us because they need help. So in most cases, yes, the wisdom teeth are gone. I've got eight amalgam fillings. Holy smokes. So yeah, I mean, it is part of the puzzle. I think for me, you know, I did have cavitations. I, I guess I just had a small mouth. I mean, I didn't have my wisdom teeth. They didn't come in. They were impacted. And also my 12 year molars were impacted too, which is pretty unusual. So I had eight, I had all four wisdom teeth removed and I had all four 12 year molars. Wow. So hopefully I've got some chompers left when I'm old, old, old to <laughs> chew my grass fed steak with, but, uh, it's, it's a big smoking gun in regards to some of the brain stuff. Like I definitely noticed a difference after getting those cleaned up. Basically what they'll do, I would try to avoid a cone beam if you can. A cone beam is basically a 3D x-ray. It's a lot of radiation to the head though. I would prefer people not to get it unless they have to. Certain oral surgeons who specialize in cavitations, that those are these necrotic you know, dead, black, disgusting bone in your jawbone. That's a, a dental infection. Some surgeons can use a, just a standard x-ray, a pano x-ray, and they can look and determine, they'll see typically a dark, looks typically dark, like the bone typically looks white on the x-ray. It'll look kind of dark and sludgy looking near these, where these roots would be. And that's how uh, we knew that I had cavitation. So they went in there, they cleaned it all out and they said, yeah, I mean, it, was it was black it was necrotic bone down in there what is that doing well that's leaking into your bloodstream and that massively affects the brain and the heart i had massive heart palpitations i'm talking every single night we put the kids down to bed i'd be sitting on the couch of my wife and oh my god and i would take herbs as a nice band-aid right i would use motherwort and passion flower and things to calm the heart but it wasn't the root cause the root cause were these cavitations i remember then i was in texas I did a podcast with my surgeon, Dr. Nunnally. People want to check it out. We did it all about cavitations. Uh, okay. Awesome guy. I remember the night after I got the procedure done that I had no heart palpitations. And it was the first night in years that I did not have heart palpitations. And I noticed it was easier to speak. I mean, I talk to people all day, so I need my, my, my tongue to work. And I was, I was getting stuck up on my words all the time. And then after getting that procedure done, I was able to talk much more clear and eloquently without stumbling. Mm -hmm. It's not like I was stuttering. It was just that my brain, it was almost like I wanted to put words in the wrong part of the sentence. You know, it was just this little mental mishap and that cleared up significantly after getting those removed. So yeah, if you're someone listening, who's had root canal, who's had some tooth extraction or multiple teeth extraction, you may want to investigate cavitations as a potential because for me, it wasn't the number one smoking gum, but it's definitely a negative impact on your health. And there are some discussions about cancers and cavitations. I only had these cavitations from the time I got my teeth removed to the time I got the clean out surgery was probably only five years. So I didn't have a, a too long of a period of time for these infections to take place. But man, in those short years, it was, it was intense. And when you're, you know, out in the woods, miles away from civilization, and you start having heart palpitations, it gets kind of concerning. You're like, um, what's going to happen? I'm, you know, two hour hike away from any medical help. This is not fun. And so it kind of really put a damper on my life for a while. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty intense. That, and when your emperor like that starts speaking to you, you got to pay attention. Uh, you know, I learned early on um, really addressing the oral cavity and health around the brain health. Um, just had some patients early on. They weren't progressing over about seven to eight months of uh, a program. And it just hit me like, oh my gosh, I, I fumbled the ball here. I didn't ask about your d oral hygiene dental uh, history. And lo and behold, she's like, oh yeah, I have this root canal. I haven't been dealing with it for like 18 months. I was like, oh my gosh, let's get that taken care of. Uh, and it cleared up. Then her sinus infection cleared and uh, she got full functionality of her brain back. 
Um, so that was an unfortunate learning experience on my part, but I ne will never forget to ask on the dental health front on cavities, uh, history of amalgam fillings, et cetera. Um, so that's it's hard. What we do is hard. I mean, we're having to act as the 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 dentist questionnaire. I mean, we're we're asking about the heart, the brain, the sleep, the sex drive, the mood. I mean, what we do is 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 tough work. I mean, it's uh, it's easy when you get in your own lane to want to look over and skip over some of these things. But you know, people like you and I, it's it's a lot of attention to detail, and this is why a lot of people fall between the cracks. For sure. So with that said, uh, coming down to the home stretch of the, of the program here, any final wisdom for the listeners of what the health? Yeah, I would say get your labs run, look into some of these things. I hope I've planted some seeds. If you go into, uh, I've got a lot of teachers as clients and you know, the teachers will feel better during the summer. And then when school starts back up in the fall, they go back into the classroom and all of a sudden they have a sinus infection again and they have major brain fog and now they have candida again and they're depressed and anxious again. No, it's not just the students, it's the environment. Schools are moldy. They don't have much budget. They don't properly fix leaks when they happen. That kind of thing happens all the time. I've tested hundreds of schools. I've rarely found a school that wasn't moldy unless it was a relatively new build or it was out in the desert or something where there wasn't much going on. And so it's a big problem. But you can get the labs, you can identify what the heck is going on, uh, what the health is going on, right? Yeah, what the and, hell? Uh, and, and so once you get your data, you're going to be much more targeted, right? You're not just going to listen to someone like me and go take a bunch of random pills. You really want to test, not guess. That's my whole philosophy is get the data so you know what you're up against. And then, you know, for a compliance uh, for, for practitioners out there too, I've heard many people poo-poo testing and like, oh, you don't need to do that. You know, everybody needs detox. It's like, well... Yeah, but how are you going to get your client to be compliant to, number one, purchase six months worth of detox support from you? And then number two, how are they going to know beyond symptoms that they're better and they're less toxic? So for me, the labs are a great piece to show them on paper. Hey, remember we talked about that symptom? Yeah, look, it's tied into this chemical. There it is. Your levels are 50 times higher because you go get your hair colored at the hair salon every two weeks, and that's a massive neurotoxin. we got to get that crap out of your system. And so... I think the data is key. And then in the meantime, for the brain, it's fine to use some, some nootropics. If you need to use phosphatidylcholine, if you want to use uh, phosphatidylserine, if you want to use acetyl-L-carnitine, uh, I like to use Bacopa. I like Ginkgo. I like Vinpocetine. I like B vitamins. I like mitochondrial support. There's a lot of things you can use to help uh, with the brain, whether it's tyrosine or Macuna. We like to use Macuna velvet bean for, for brain function. We like to use tryptophan and 5-HTP for helping with serotonin. Uh, we like to use Pharma GABA, which is like a fermented uh, bioavailable GABA if we need to calm somebody down. So there's a lot of cool like tools that we have in this space for the brain that you can use to buy people time. And if you can get people feeling better, I'm okay with that. You know, you may say, hey, look, you know, this is not necessarily root cause. It could be, but this might not be the end of the rope here, but let's get you feeling better. Let's go ahead and try to boost your dopamine by giving you some tyrosine. Let's run some labs. And hey, guess what? By the next time you talk, they've got more energy. They've got more focus. They've got more drive. Hey, you know what, Evan? I went and cleaned all the cupboards out. I haven't cleaned under my, uh, my cabinets for 20 years. I've got Tupperware from the 1980s down here I just threw away uh, because my brain's finally working enough to comprehend something like that. So... Um, at the end of the day, it's really, really rewarding for us as the clinician, but for, for you too, as a client or patient listening to, to see those small wins and just know that there's always room for improvement. So hang in there. Awesome. Evan, thank you so much for coming on What the Health. Everyone, if you like the show, please go out, give us a review. It does matter. It's how people find us. It's how we get this message out. Please share us with your loved ones. Uh, we are here Tuesdays from 2 to 3 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Tune in next week. Thanks for tuning in. Take care.